Buenas tardes. En la tarde de hoy tenemos de visita al doctor Daniel Chang. El doctor Daniel Chan es profesor de patología, oncología, urología y radiología de la Universidad de John Hopkins, en donde lleva trabajando ya eh, 25 años. El doctor Chan es, eh, obtuvo su bachillerato de la Universidad de Oregon en biología con una concentración menor en química. Posteriormente hizo su doctorado en State University of New York en Buffalo y luego hizo estudios postdoctorales en el laboratorio de Clinical Chemistry del doctor Max Chilcott en, en Buffalo, New York. Desde entonces lo, eh, empezó a trabajar con la Universidad de John Hopkins. El doctor Chang eh, ha enfocado su investigación en el desarrollo y aplicación del análisis proteómico al, al diagnóstico, el manejo y el tratar de entender el cáncer. Eh, ha utilizado esta técnica tratando de buscar eh, nuevos marcadores tumorales y también tratando de mirar el progreso de la enfermedad en diferentes pacientes. Tiene más de 200 publicaciones, eh, incluyendo capítulos en libros de texto de eh, química clínica y de marcadores tumorales de fisiología y de patobiología. Pertenece a la organización que se llama The Human Proteome Organization y precisamente cuando salga de aquí al final de la semana va a la primera reunión de HUPO en Estados Unidos. Ha recibido varios eh, reconocimientos. El más reciente es del North American uh, Chinese Clinical Chemistry Association que le dio un premio como Outstanding Contribution y además en el 2004 recibió otro premio que se llama el Morton Key Schwartz Award for Significant Contribution in Cancer Research. Así es que sin más preámbulos le dejo con ustedes al doctor Chan. Uh, thank you. I'm uh, delighted to come and uh, talk to you in this beautiful island of Puerto Rico. As I left Washington, D.C. yesterday, it was snowing. And in fact, um, the airplane was delayed for almost three hours. So <laughs> I didn't get in until later in the afternoon. So I'm, I'm pleased to be here. I'm sorry I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> uh, so please uh, forgive me for that. I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about clinical proteomics. And I said the question, is this the future cancer diagnostics? If you look at leading cause of death in the United States, this statistic just came out uh, very recently. This year in 2005, uh, it was found that for the first time in the history, for people that are younger than 85 years old, cancer is now the number one cause of death over heart disease. Part of the reason is because a lot of concern about cardiovascular disease through lifestyle changes and so forth. But unfortunately, cancer is a rather difficult disease to prevent. If you look at this year, the cancer statistics in the United States, the number of new cases, prostate cancer is number one, followed by breast cancer, lung cancer, colorectal cancer, and bladder cancer. Those, these are the top five type of cancer in the US. But if you look at the number of patients that died of cancer, the situations are quite different. Prostate cancer, instead of number one, is now dropped to number five. And part of the reason is that we have tests like PSA available uh, for men, and we have prostate cancer is also a slow-growing disease. Lung cancer remained the number one cause of death among all the patients, uh, with, as you can see here. Ovarian cancer is, even though the prevalence is lower, but it's actually number six in US in terms of cause of death. One of the examples that I'm going to show you today is the early detection of ovarian cancer. If you look at today's major blood tests for cancer in clinical use, at least in the United States, this requires approval by FDA. You can see there's not too many cancer markers I listed here. Maybe there's about a dozen or so. 
And so if you look at breast cancer, for example, we have CA15-3, 27-29, or HERB2 new. Prostate cancer, we have PSA in terms of total, free, and complex. Ovarian cancer, CA125. Colorectal cancer, CEA. Pancreatic cancer, CA199. Uh, testicular cancer, AIP. And I also include a urine test, NMP22, for bladder cancer. But actually, most of these tumor markers are only good for monitoring therapy. They are really not very useful for early detection of cancer. So that's why we are interested in clinical proteomic, because those markers, as I show you, are not really sensitive or specific enough for cancer screening in a general population. Most of them are really good for monitoring cancer therapy. If you look at those markers, very few markers have a strong predictive value for selection of particular type of therapy. What I really mean is that oncologists would like you and me to tell them, okay, if I have this test that are positive, is you can use this kind of therapy, like chemical therapy, chemotherapy, or hormonal therapy. So they would like very specific targeted biomarkers, not general uh, you know, pro prognostic markers, for example. Even fewer markers are good for early detection of disease. An exception may be PSA for prostate cancer, but we know the problem due to false positive of a benign condition called BPH. One of the important scientific journals that I trust you read every morning is called Wall Street Journal, right? <laughs> you all read Wall Street Journal, don't you? <laughs> Unfortunately, nowadays, uh, journal, uh, paper like Wall Street Journal, New York Times are very important because many people read it and then they couldn't come and ask me, saying, hey, I read about this test. I would like to have this test from your laboratory. Can you provide me with it? So for example, on this particular issue of Wall Street Journal, the headline news was a tiny protein may lead to better tests for prostate cancer. Uh, what are they referring to as a tiny little protein? They were actually talking about a cutting edge research technology called proteomics. They even talk about proteomic in Wall Street Journal. It's emerging as medical science the best hope for an alternative to the widely inaccurate standard screen for prostate cancer. Now, what are they talking about? Widely used, you know, inaccurate tests. They're talking about PSA. You know, we said PSA is so good, but actually PSA also has a lot of problem. And the problem is shown in this slide here. Joe Ostring was one of my residents when he was at Johns Hopkins uh, at that time. And he published this paper showing that if you look at a cutoff of PSA of four nanograms per ml, which is what we all use as a cutoff. If you look at four nanograms per ml, when it's greater than four, yes, a lot of cancer in red are present, but there's a lot of blue, which are benign condition, BPH. But what happens when PSA is less than four? Well, you have majority of the normal healthy men as well as the benign condition, but you have as much as 20 to 30 percent prostate cancer patients that has PSA less than four. So if you are over 50 years old and you have a PSA done on yourself and they come in less than four, now don't go out and just party all night because you may have prostate cancer because you know some of the prostate cancer patients have low PSA values. So this shows you the problem associated with this tumor marker PSA for that. What are the major forms of PSA in circulation? I thought I'd take a few minutes, just go over some of this information. Some of you may be very familiar with it, other may never heard of it. So, uh, so I think it would be good for me to just spend a couple of minutes to talk about this. In breath circulation serum, which is what we use to detect PSA, there's two major forms, free PSA and complex PSA. Now, why is PSA complex? Because PSA is a protease. What does protease do? Now, you, you in biochemistry, you know, protease is an enzyme that chew up proteins. You don't want a protease to be moving around in blood circulation freely, would you? Because you're going to chew up all your proteins. So then you said, oh, if PSA is a protease, then I would predict that PSA will be complex with an inhibitor. And in this case, that's true. It complex with anti-chymotrypsin, and it's called alpha-1 anti-chymotrypsin. And you can see this molecule here, ACT, which is a much larger molecule than PSA itself. 
So when you combine with PSA, molecular weight is about 100 kD. PSA by itself has less than 30,000 uh, kD. So there's free PSA and there's complex PSA, and that's how we measure now in addition to total PSA. But I want to tell you a little more that a lot of people may not know about it, because in the 1980s, we have PSA. We're very happy we have PSA. But then in the 1990s, we know those free and complex I just told you. But now we know that PSA is more complicated than we thought. In fact, the free PSA are, consists of different forms. They have one form is called a BPSA, which is associated with benign condition, BPH. Uh, there's a PPSA, which is more associated with uh, the prostate cancer. So maybe we're going to be able to find even more specific tumor marker for prostate cancer. Well, usually I'd stop there and I don't tell you anymore, but since you are uh, in biochemistry, many of you, so I thought I'd tell you a little bit more about what those molecules are. Okay, the BPSA actually come from the transition zone of the prostate. For those of you in urology, you know this is where the zone typically, the benign condition arise, BPH, and they secrete this form called a BPSA into the circulation. Most prostate cancer actually come from a peripheral zone, and it, uh, it secrete this molecule called a PPSA. It's actually a precursor of PSA. You remember enzymes are released as what? Proenzyme, right? Uh, proenzyme is an inactive form of the enzyme. So again, you can now translate biochemistry into clinical medicine. Well, then PSA should be first released as a proenzyme because it's an inactive form. And in fact, that's much more prevalent in the cancer stage. And finally, I want to tell you more specifically each one of those forms. We have PSA molecule here. It tells you there's an active site, there's an N-terminal and C-terminal. But what is really this pro-PSA? It actually has a seven extra amino acid on the N-terminal. So it has, uh, it's a, a little longer molecule and it's enzymatically inactive. Because it's inactive, therefore it cannot complex with alpha-1 antichymotrypsin as an inhibitor. And so that's why it's circulating free in circulation. On the other hand, the BPSA, which comes from benign condition, its uh, amino acid sequence is identical to the, to the you know, native or uh, mature PSA, but the lysine-145 and lysine-182 has been clifted. So it changed conformation because it changed conformation is, again, incapable of forming complex with ACT, and that explains why we have free PSA in circulation for that. Well, <coughs> let's talk about clinical proteomic. It has a lot of promises, but the, what is the major problem of clinical proteomic? I don't know if you can read step two, which is most important here. That a miracle happened. <coughs> well, the reason that people criticize that is often you have a black box, and you said, okay, you put sample on one side and come out on the other side. Now I can diagnose prostate cancer for you. I can d diagnose breast cancer for you. Would you believe that? Most people don't. They say, well, I have to understand how it works. Unfortunately, initially, clinical proteomics present this kind of problem and approach to people. Trust me. <laughs> no, it's not going to trust you. Sci scientists, you've got to have a proof. So um, as this slide is saying, I think you should be more explicit in step two here. Then a miracle happened. Now, one of the papers that I'm not going to name name of this paper that some of you may have read about it, uh, first paper that came out in Lancet, which is a very respectable medical journal on proteomic profiling. And basically, what he's saying is that by looking at a profile, you can diagnose ovarian cancer with 100% sensitivity and 95% specificity. Subsequently, another paper came out from the same group indicating that they can now identify ovarian cancer with 100% sorry, sensitivity and specificity. So I never believe anything that's 100% sensitive and specific because I know that there's experimental errors and I know that we're not perfect. So how can this be possible? Um, last year, there was a paper from uh, MD Anderson Cancer Institute. I know they have some collaboration with your institution. And in fact, this group of people from MD Anderson taking the same data as I just showed you before and reanalyze. Okay. 
Uh, Keith Beckley is the first author on this, and the title of the paper is called Reproducibility of Cell Detox Protein Patterns in Serum, Comparing Data from Different Experiments. I jump to the conclusion, just simply saying that what they found is much of the structure and cover in those experiments could be due to the artifact of sample processing and not to, due to the underlying biology of cancer. This shows us one of the problems with new technology and new approach is that sometimes we uh, focus too much on the disease process and forget that unless you are carefully choose the technology, the specimen, and the study design, you may draw very wrong conclusion. So what do we need? I think we need new technology to discover biomarkers. We need well-characterized clinical specimens. What do I mean by that? I mean, you have to understand the diagnosis, the stage of the disease, how those patients were diagnosed, and the clinical information associated with that. You need bioinformatics. This becomes become very important now for not only data analysis, because on mass spectrometry, we see many, many peaks and many, many data points. But how do you know which one of those truly represented protein? Or how do you know any of those protein are truly a biomarker that are useful for it? The other point is we need multiplex of biomarkers. We need multiple markers. Uh, gone are the days of when we think one protein and one marker is going to help us diagnose a disease. For example, PSA, we might be asking too much for a molecule like PSA to diagnose prostate cancer because we now know most diseases, particular cancer, are very heterogeneous. Some cancer has different cell types, some different you know, uh, etiology, why those kind of cancer comes up. So therefore, we probably need a set of biomarkers allow us to diagnose disease. We then know need to have well-designed and multi-center kind of studies. And I, I'll tell you a little more about that later. Obviously, we would like to develop biomarker uh, that uh, have biological or clinical significance, and finally, to be able to use it for clinical diagnostics. The Center of Biomarker Discovery at Johns Hopkins was started about five years ago. I actually founded the center, and I'm the director since the, the beginning of that. And um, the purpose of this center is to discover biomarker of clinical and scientific significance by developing, improving, and using state-of-the-art technology like proteomic and bioinformatic. We want to focus the discovery on biomarker for early detection of disease treatment and for management of cancer and for understanding cancer biology also. We then want to develop specific assays for the discover biomarkers and validate them and then ultimately translate into clinical practice. I thought I'd show you the picture of my clinical proteomics team. Uh, this is about 12 of our scientists in front of the Johns Hopkins Hospital. And um, we have, uh, we have uh, cancer biologists, we have biochemists, we, have, we even have um, uh, Dr. Zhang, who is our bioinformatic expert. He actually has a PhD in electrical engineering because we now need a different type of people to work together for that. And hopefully the discover that we find we then move on to this next group, which I call cancer diagnostic team. And this is a group of uh, four medical technologists, myself and associate director. What we want to do is be able to do quality control. We want to be able to uh, do clinical laboratory standards for validating those markers. And we do clinical trial and so forth. And my uh, core laboratory, I actually have 250 staff. They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> you know, while I'm speaking here, they're working hard at home. <laughs> and we use highly automated machine like this. So if you go to your clinical lab in the hospital, maybe they will be somewhat similar. Maybe they are smaller because we have a very big hospital. So I have many automated machines like this basically run through. Uh, the, well, Johns Hopkins Hospital has 1,000 beds. So it's, it's pretty big for them. I'll briefly tell you about the HUPO, uh, Human Proteome Organization. Um, among uh, projects that they set up, one of the most important ones is called Plasma Proteome Project. And in this group, I chaired a committee on reference specimen and standardization. Uh, my committee uh, 
created a set of reference specimen. And, and the reason we created a, a set of reference specimen is when you want to compare different technology or different methods, such as two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, Western block, HPLC, you know, or you know, mass spec, or you know, protein microarray, ELISA. How can you compare anything if you don't have a same set of specimen that you can compare to, right? So when the HUPO first started about three years ago, there was a lot of argument about what kind of technology would be best to be used. And so being from a clinical lab, I said, well, how can you compare that? We, let's come up with a set of reference specimens. So we work with Beck and Dickinson, which is a company that makes uh, bread joint vacuum uh, tubes. We make one serum and plasma, but for plasma, you need anticoagulants. So we have three different kind of anticoagulants. And we draw the blood from three ethnic groups, uh, Caucasian, uh, African-American, and Asian-American. Hate to tell you that we don't have a draw a Hispanic group <laughs> for this study. We, that's, that's something that you could propose to do. Those specimens were sent to 31 laboratories in 14 different countries. And the result of that initially was reported last year at the first, um, at the third HUPO Congress. A few brief things that I want to just let you know what we find. The first thing is in plasma protein, the ch number one challenge is dynamic range. If you look at here, the highest concentration protein in plasma is what protein? Yes, human serum albumin. It has 60, uh, if you want to use this unit, 60 grams per liter. And the lower one, this, this is by no means all the protein. It's just some representing proteins that we have ELISA to measure those. The lower protein like cytokines, uh, like some of the grow growth factors, like troponins, like um, you know, uh, PSAs, let's say. They are about 10 to the 8, 10 minus 8, 10 to the minus 9. So you, you are looking at such a 10 to the 10 difference in terms of concentration. There are no one single analytical technique that allow you to measure all those proteins. Even if you're trying to go through fractionation or dilution, you still have difficulty looking for those proteins. So that's a difficult thing. Well, it's a difficult challenge, but the good news is that that means there are a lot of work could be done for many years. So we, we're not going to run out of things to do, right? So we just have to keep working on it. The report, yes, yes. Uh, yes, there are some differences. I didn't show you that. Yeah, I, I didn't show you that. This is only one specimen, actually, one plasma specimen. There are some differences. I can, uh, let's see, this, um, um, let me show you this too, and then, uh, then see if it answers some of your question. At the last uh, scientific congress, actually, took place in Beijing in October last year. Uh, this 31 laboratory analyzed by mass spectrometry, and, um, and some of those labs use triptych digest, and then they look for peptides. As you know, with high-end mass specs, uh, you cannot detect the whole proteins. Uh, uh, MAUDI, you can detect protein up to a certain limit. But if you're looking for those unique peptides coming from proteins, if you use only one single peptide as a determinant, there's 9,500 protein detected in plasma. If you use two peptides as the criteria, it dropped to 3,000. And it, it tells us several things. One is that uh, at the moment, there's no agreement among laboratory in terms of how many proteins are in plasma or serum. Using different technology is going to give you very different results. And even using the same technology, but you use different procedure, you're going to get different results for that. So there's a lot of more work need to be done. There's actually many more protein found in serum than plasma, but I have to qualify what protein is. Now, how do you define protein? Is that a peptide a protein? Some people consider peptides protein. Some people consider fragments of protein protein. So if you're including peptides and fragments, there are, there are many more found in serum than plasma. And interesting, you know the major difference between serum and plasma, number one is coagulation step. Right? And during coagulation, many of the uh, factor might be released or protein might be cleaved by protease and so forth. So that's one reason. The other one reason could be due to the anticoagulant that was used. Uh, as, uh, <coughs> we use three anticoagulants. Um, what, how does anticoagulant works? For example, EDTA. 
How's the EDTA works? I'm sure you know. EDTA, right, it chelate, chelate calcium. So it's good and bad. It's good, it inhibit, you know, the, the coagulation process. But the bad thing is it inhibits some of the, it take away this molecule, uh, EDTA take away calcium and so forth. So some of the enzyme that need those as a cofactors may not work at all. So if you are interested in looking for enzymes, you could have a problem. But if you're interested in just look at protein fragments, then there's no problem for, th for that, you know? So it depends on what you are looking for and how many protein or peptide you will find. The other fine thing is that I just summarized this briefly, is that pre-analytical factor will affect the result for proteonic analysis, and that includes specimen type, plasma serum, and so forth, how the blood is collected. How do you process them? Because you have to the centrifuge, you have to store them, you know, storage, transportation, you send it to a different laboratory, what kind of condition, how do you, do you freeze it, and what temperature do you freeze it, and so forth. Unfortunately, those factors affect different methods to different degree. They are not all the same. And so therefore, we recommend if you're going to a retrospectively collected serum bank, you need to know as much of those information as possible, and for, new studies that you're going to be perspective collected, then you need to control as many of those variables as possible. I know this is kind of a, a quick brief summary. In fact, um, next week uh, is the first U.S. HUPO Congress, and I'm speaking Monday morning actually in Washington about some of this issue that we find. The other concept that we talk about is what we call multiplexing. Multiplexing is that you need multiple uh, biomarkers in a panel to diagnose a disease. And one of the um, system that being developed by Beckman Coulter is called A square microarray system. And basically, this kind of system looks like a microtiter plate, but it's a, a kind of a deeper well. And they have different uh, location to immobilize antibody on it. So then you can do, uh, say, four, five, six different assays all at once in the same well because you have different you know, antibody uh, there, and you can use robots and, um, you know, and lasers and whatever to detect them. Well, one of the problems, as we said, is human serum, albumin, MIGGS, and so forth, that uh, could significantly affect what protein you're going to find. And many people, commercially available techniques, and we ourselves actually developed a method that was published in proteomics in 2003 to deplete high abundant protein. And we make a, a mini column with antibody against um, uh, human serum albumin, but we also have um, uh, protein G uh, in there. And as you know, protein G would bind uh, immunoglobulins. So with this small uh, affinity spin tube columns, we were able to remove uh, both the albumin and IgG in one step. And then we run two-dimensional gel electrophoresis and this is one example to show you cancer versus control. And just like many people, we are look for up-regulated or down-regulated that are different among the, the 2D gel. But we find 2D gel to be cumbersome and slow, so we also try the cell D technology uh, for that. And this is a case study that I'm going to show you. I have uh, sent this uh, paper uh, to, to some of you, and it came out in cancer research last year. And it would make several points uh, on the importance of doing a proteomic study. So that's what I thought I would use this uh, as an example uh, to show you. Um, obviously, if you look at the title, it's called Three Biomarkers Identified from Serum Proteomic Analysis for Early Detection of uh, Ovarian Cancer. So we are looking not just protein profiling, we are actually trying to identify specific proteins that might be responsible for the clinical usefulness. Second point is a, is a multi-center study. We have people from MD Anderson, Duke, uh, from uh, Sydney, Australia, from Netherlands, and from uh, London, and we collaborate with Cyphogens uh, for that. Some of you know that uh, Bob Bass who's from MD Anderson and Ian Jacob from UK, which are leaders in the ovarian cancer field. The other problem is ovarian cancers are very difficult, just like in Puerto Rico, f to find early stage ovarian cancer because we don't have a good marker. So most patients that are present with stage three and four, uh, when you have stage four ovarian cancer, your five-year survival is less than 20%. 
But if you can find uh, ovarian cancer at stage one, uh, five year survival could be as much as 90%. So we desperately need biomarker that allow us to detect early stage of ovarian cancer. But because of a difficulty getting early stage uh, sample, how do you study them? So we went all around the world and collected this specimen, uh, including our sample at Johns Hopkins, and did this study. Uh, this slide is a little complicated. Uh, the detail is not important, but I want to point out a few things to you about the importance of study design. The important thing is that each site you have to treat it separately. What I mean is, okay, for example, you can use this site from Netherlands as a discovery set. You use Duke University as a separate discovery set, and then you compare the two sets. Okay, and why do you want to do that? You cross validate it, and only those markers survive this cross validation would be useful because you don't want a marker just useful in Puerto Rico and not in Johns Hopkins, for example. And then we use the third site as an independent validation, and we use another site for a different technique. So the important point is that you have multiple sites, and you use independent discovery validation uh, for arriving on those. In terms of experiment, this is our proteomic profiling protocol. What we did is we take a tube of serum. Instead of putting one drop of serum on the chip service, we go through a fractionation first. And in fact, we fractionate them by pH into six different fractions. The advantage of a six fraction is that uh, human serum albumin tend to move to one or two fractions. IgG or transferrin might be moved to some other fraction. So you can analyze each of the fraction independently, see what kind of biomarker you find. Therefore, you can try to find lower abundant proteins, preferably. We do it in a replicate of three because unfortunately, chips experiments are not all reproducible. And in order to get consistent result, we run it in a replicate of three. Initially, we don't know what kind of chip will give you the best result, so we actually f use four different kind of chips. IMAC, SEX is uh, uh, ion exchange, H50 is a hydrophobic chip, and this is a WCX is a weak ion, cation exchange. And we try each one of those chips and see which one uh, can, can you know, give you the best um, um, result in terms of protein separations and so forth. So, but the disadvantage is that one patient sample now becomes 72 spots. So, so in a study like what we did of 500 patients, that's 35,000 spots that we have to do. So it's a lot of work and uh, it's very expensive. So fortunately we negotiate with the Cyphogen that they give us all the chip for free. <laughs> So, but of course they want something back, right? <laughs> There's no free lunch. <coughs> anyway, um, we use this out of protein chip array that I mentioned to you. Uh, uh, some of you may be familiar with it. Basically, the top portions are what I call biochemical uh, chemical chips. They are non-specific, but they are different properties. Like I mentioned to you, you know, normal phase, reverse phase, and so forth. Typically, we use those kind of chips to capture protein because we don't know what we are looking for. It's like go fishing, you know, and, and if you use a, a net with a big hole, you probably catch bigger fish, right? And if you use a small hole, you catch smaller fish or more fish. And it depends on how you're gonna use it, you capture different proteins. Once you find a protein, then you develop specific kind of chips. For example, antibody. You can develop antibody against a specific kind of protein and you can bind it on a chip and see how much and what kind it binds. You can also looking for uh, uh, ligand or protein-protein interaction by immobilize your protein of interest on the chip and then see what protein it would associate with. And then you read it off on a mass spectrometry, which is the cell process. I'll just briefly show you. Protein chip, you put a sample on here and you wash anything that's not binding to the chip surface. Uh, it should be showing you here, yes. And then what do you do? A laser beam comes down, hits on the protein chip service. And the protein would then desorb from the chip service. And uh, they would be separated by molecular weight. So this process is called CELD, which is service enhanced laser desorption, ionization. And this chip basically will read in a mass spectrometry like this inside. If you are an expert on mass spec or you talk to the mass spectrometry experts, they will tell you that, hey, this box is no good. <laughs> 
it's like a quick and dirty mass spec, yeah, because trying to read those protein chip. And the example is just like mainframe computer versus PC. You know, PC was made for everybody to use. Mainframe computer is made for specialists to use. And uh, Cyphergen intend to make this box kind of a broad audience everybody use. But unfortunately, I think that they, they, they make it so, they tell you that it's so simple that um, they just let you have it and really don't help you on that. So many people have difficulty trying to come up with useful uh, discovery for that. Now, after you put the chip in the machine, you get all the spectrum, then you need uh, bioinformatics. <coughs> and we actually developed a bioinformatic program called UMSA, which is for a nonlinear classification, uh, developed by the Dr. Zhang, who's uh, the person that I told you has a PhD in electrical engineering. Now, I'm not an expert on bioinformatics. I, I'm not going to fool you that I know everything about this. But uh, for those people who want to know what kind of program it is, it's actually a modified support vector machine, SVM. Some of you who knows bioinformatics would, would know this terminology. SVM is, is one of the uh, kind of a newer approach to do uh, separation. Basically, it's a nonlinear separation, trying to separate cancer from uh, non-cancer. And then we construct ROC curve. You probably, you may have heard about ROC curve is receiver operating characteristic curve. And that basically plots sensitivity against specificity. So what we want to know is before we actually ID the protein, we wanted to know that protein peak, what kind of sensitivity and specificity it can achieve for you in the construction and ROC curve format. So we rank each one of the protein peaks. And this is the top 15 peaks that we, we rank out. But it's not only how high you would rank. Well, you would always say, well, the, the, the number one protein should be the best. Uh, maybe the top three, top five protein would be the best. But also how consistently each one of those protein peak rank, and which is indicated by a yellow line here, which is the standard deviation. So you want a protein that rank high, but also consistently rank high. So you have a small standard deviation and rank high for that. So using this program, we pick the top three protein. And this is a typical spectrum I want to show you. <coughs> this is just a stage one ovarian cancer patient uh, versus healthy uh, uh, con uh, controls. And uh, unfortunately, if you're just looking for the major peaks, uh, you see some difference between that. But the, the biggest peak is not necessarily the best marker because they could be very common proteins. So what you really need is to analyze all the peaks, trying to find out which one has the best differentiation between the two types. For example, we find there's a protein down here, which is actually sho shoulder peak of this big peak, and the molecular weight is 12.8 uh, kD. And then we find another one is 28 kD, and one is 3,272. So those are the three markers that we find seems to help us on the ROC curve sensitivity and specificity. Well, once we find those three markers, we then do a, uh, well, this is our ROC curve to show you. So again, sensitivity versus one minus specificity here. The green line indicates CA125, which is a standard assay. You can see quantitatively we call AUC area under the curve, and which is 0.77. And this three biomarker we find actually have an AUC of 0.885, so indicating it's significantly better than the CA125. So we have some indication that clinically it's promising, it looks good for stage one, two ovarian cancer. Therefore, uh, we move on and do the standard biochemistry for protein ID. Now before I go to protein ID, I will just want to show you some sensitivity and specificity, which came out from the paper. And, and uh, again, the, the real sense, uh, how many percent is not that important, but I want to tell you several things. The first thing you should do is, Many people do the training. You have to do the training set first for uh, any program you're going to use. Uh, but training often gives you higher sensitivity and specificity. Then you do a testing. And I, you can see the testing is still not bad, 80 some percent, but it's not as good as, uh, you know, close to 100 percent for that. But obviously, you need to have training set and testing set. And then you need to move on, do validation, we call it. And this are the validation, sensitivity, and specificity. You can see, again, sensitivity now is in the low 80%, specificity is in the high 90%. Uh, not as good as training and testing, but 
uh, respectable for validation for them. Now you remember I show you just maybe half an hour ago that there was the first paper published saying that they have 100%, right? And I, I can actually give you 100% sensitivity specificity if I only use one site and only use the training set. Because you train the program to recognize that. Of course, you get 100%. If I do the testing set, it has a sensitivity of 100% and 92% specificity. But again, this is only from one site. The other thing what I call survival, you all watch this show survival, right, on the TV? And, and in biomarker discovery, you need to follow survival principle. <laughs> you look at two, um, two sites, okay, and you match those biomarkers in terms of molecular weight. And only those that can survive the two sites are true survivors. And then can move on to compete for the winner at the end. <laughs> All right, um, this is a protein purification scheme. It's very busy. Again, details not important to you because you in biochemistry, you would know. You basically, we go back and take the sample. We do things like uh, chromatography. We do uh, SDS page. We do uh, triptych digest of the protein. We cut into you know different peptides. We do peptide mass fingerprinting, and then we finally do the tandem mass spec to identify what pe uh, peptide and what protein those are. And those three uh, molecules are identified as the first one with a molecular weight of 12.8 uh, kD, turn out to be a truncated form of transthyrectin, lacking N-terminal 10 amino acid. Now, the transthyrectin by itself is a high abundant protein, but this truncated form a lacking 10 amino acid on the N-terminal seems to be more specific to ovarian cancer. The second protein we find is apolipoprotein A1. Now, this is a common protein. The third one we find is a fragment of a molecule called ITIH4, which is stands for human inter-alpha trypsin inhibitor heavy chain H4 for that. We did some independent immunoassay. Um, at the time, we uh, don't have a specific antibody. Specific antibodies are not easy to develop unless a small peptide or truncated form, so we're still working on it. But we thought we just take two ELISA assay off the shelf and just to see what kind of specificity and uh, sensitivity they might have in terms of different type of cancer. And, and here I plot, uh, here I plot, uh, I guess they cannot leave me alone. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> Are you more important? So. Uh, independent validation in immunoassays. Um, we're looking at transdirectin versus apolipoprotein A1. And the reds are uh, 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 ovarian cancer, the green are non-cancer. There are some overlap, but I just wanted you to focus on this two region here. So by adding several things like breast cancer, prostate cancer, and, and, oh, sorry, and colon cancer, they seem to associate more with the green than red. And because of that, uh, uh, we move on further to do more study. The other thing, I want, the final thing I want to show you is this thing called a correlation network. Um, one of the advantage of actually identifying the protein is that you don't want to stop there. And why don't you want to stop there? Because those three proteins you find, number one, you need to understand why those proteins are there for ovarian cancer. Is there any biological significance related to the cancer process? So you want to study are there other proteins on the same pathway, let's say. The second thing is that you want to see if other proteins that might be interacting with these proteins. And if they're interacting with those proteins, you might find additional biomarker. In fact, you could find even better biomarkers. So we developed a program called Correlation Networking by looking at uh, the disease and by uh, looking at which protein interact with the protein that we find. Uh, and in the case of red, it's positive interaction. In the case of uh, yellowish green is uh, negative, uh, negative uh, um, correlation, and if there's no correlation, there, there's no line drawn from them. As a result of this, we actually identify several new proteins that we are investigating now further into that. So in conclusion, what I have shown you is a five center case control study identify a panel of uh, three biomarkers with potential for detecting early stage of epithelial ovarian cancer. 
By using extensive cross-site validation and independent validation, we were able to alleviate impact of possible confining variable and trying to focus more on the true biology. Identification of those proteins uh, could lead to the development of clinical diagnostics and you know, understanding of biological significance. And <coughs> as much as I told you, if those of you who play tennis, I'm sure Puerto Rico is a great place to play tennis. The weather is so nice. Uh, I'm a tennis player, but in, uh, back home, we, we have to play indoor. <laughs> um, probably, um, I would say half of the year, we have to play indoor. <coughs> But uh, even though I show you a lot of exciting thing about clinical proteomics, there's still a lot of things we don't know about it. Just like you're playing tennis, you need to pay attention to the backhand. So what do I think about a future can cancer diagnostic? I think it would be, I told you about proteomic, but I think the genomic, we cannot forget that too. We probably need biochips based on genomic and proteomic. Uh, we need to be able to analyze all kinds of patient specimens, not just serum but also tissues, cells. Uh, we're working with our cytopathologists looking at fine needle biopsy. We do laser capture micro dissection, trying to find out what kind of proteomics might be there. Uh, a multiple marker panel, I think, would be the way to go. And we need bioinformatics not only to analyze the data, but to enhance the clinical utility. And finally, I think diagnosis will be based on genomic, proteomic, and imaging, such as PET scan, CT scan, and MRI to provide what we call personalized medicine. And one of the reasons that I'm also a professor in radiology is because we're trying to combine all these different techniques. It doesn't matter what it is. The key thing is we want to make diagnosis individualized on a patient. Just want to let you know, those of you who are interested in proteomics, there are several major proteomic conferences this year that if you can come, most of uh, uh, the ones that I'm showing you in US, but uh, there's also the HUPO meeting. As I mentioned, actually, starting this um, Sunday night, actually, <laughs> in uh, Crystal City, Virginia, which is across from uh, Washington, D.C., is the first uh, scientific congress of U.S. HUPO. And uh, because of that, unfortunately, I cannot come next week. <laughs> I understand you have a major conference uh, here. And, and then the, uh, the next annual World Congress for the HUPO is going to be in Munich, Germany, the last week of August. Uh, ASMS is American Society of Mass Spectrometry. Uh, they are organizing a biomarker conference in October in Monterey, California. And finally, the AACC uh, Clinical Chemistry Society created a, a, a proteomic division. I'm the chair-elect of this uh, division. The first proteomic conference is going to take place in Washington, D.C. in October 24-25. For those of you who want to go in to find out more about this, you can go into the website on all those. USHUPO.org has a website, HUPO.org has a website, ASMS has a website, AACC has a website. So it's very easy for you to just go into the web, find out the details about that, and you can, you know, come to the meeting. The funding, so I talked to you, uh, funded by the NCI Prostate Spore Grant and also the Biomarker uh, Core, the NCI Early Detection Research Network, EDIN Reference Lab, and also for bio cyphogen biosystems. And this is our proteomic team hard at work in China because last year we had this HUPO Congress. Six of us actually presented from our group and we spent it, we, 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 you know, we, we took a day off to climb the Great Wall. So we thought this is important for team building. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. That's all I'm going to say. Anything you can, say. yeah. You know, one of the issues that comes up over and over is uh, staging of the patients. The, the clinical part of uh, keeping a uniform sample where you're going to be extracting the samples. How are you dealing with this? Um, it, it, your question could be referred to uh, either knowing exactly what stage it is or. Uh, whether you need marker for staging, are you talking about both ways? Or are you, if you want to know, uh, yes, it's important to know exactly, as I said, well characterized sample. So that would be clinical staging or pathological staging. 
in the case of prostate cancer, for example, we know pathologic staging is really the correct staging because often clinical staging is before you take the sample out and you, you often understage them. So staging is not a simple, and I'm in the Department of Pathology, but I know that uh, staging sometimes is subjective, not totally objective. So that's one issue is how accurate are the staging. The second issue is related to the biomarkers. Some markers are very good for helping staging, other are not. For example, this marker, the, this set of marker we found, apparently is not very good for staging. Um, and so which is good and bad? Uh, bad is that it's not useful for staging. It means it's not increasing with stage. But the good news is that we are interested in detecting early stage. So, so now we can use marker for early stage. Most of the marker traditionally tend to be low for early stage and high for late stage. So that means it's good for detecting late stage, not good for detecting early stage. So I think those, both of those are, are very important. If you need a marker for staging, then you should look for those biomarkers that changes with different stage. Uh, uh, but if you're looking for early detection, you may not need that. Is that answer your question? Okay. Yes. For identification of those three peaks that you found, you mentioned multiple uh, instruments uh, and approaches. Which of them uh, were the minimum necessary instrument or approach that you used to identify it? Well, uh, as I mentioned, we started with CELD. Uh, in this case, we actually don't use 2D gel. So we use CELD as a screening to come up with a marker. Then we have to use standard biochemical technique to purify the protein because there is not sufficient protein on the protein chip. See, that's the problem to, uh, to let you identify it. So we have to get enough of those by using standard uh, biochemical technique. Now, in terms of mass spec, you do need a tandem mass spec for peptide mass fingerprinting because it, at that stage, they are peptides. And you have to know exactly what peptide it is. And unless you know that, you cannot positive identify that. So you need a cell kind of approach, and you need a tandem mass spec for, for protein ID. And in between will be biochemical techniques. I understand that the biochemical techniques that I want yeah. to no, and I, okay. So, uh, perhaps you use it right. for identification okay. uh, chromatography and 1D gel. Right. And then yes, the yeah. We use 1D gel for this purpose. And we actually also compare to the cell D profile because we want to be sure that what we are seeing at 1D gel is the same protein. You know, otherwise, you could misidentify them. So we want to be sure the peak, uh, whatever, or the band on the uh, cell D corresponding to that. And we wanted to be sure if we remove it, that do disappear from it. And then we do the gel, and then we do the triptych digest. Yes? Do you know how stable are the fraction obtained from the exchange chromatography, and how are you storing all these fractions? Um, how stable they are. The how stable they are would depends on what molecule you're working with. We find some, just like any protein, some protein are very stable, others are, are not stable. We have a suspicion that one of the molecules may not be as stable as we thought because when we're beginning to ex uh, do some stability studies, which for any assay development, you need to know that we find that one of the markers, when we let it sit at room temperature for uh, over 24 hours, it seems to have changed, at least the cell profile. So I, I cannot tell you exactly how stable they are, but the, the, each one you, you have to look and see how stable they are. Yes? And the reason you asked that is because uh, <laughs> consistency among different ones. Yeah, good point, good point. No, actually, in this case, I have four CLD machines myself. <laughs> and all the samples were sent to me, and we analyzed it. Uh, you s have you seen the paper come out from clinical chemistry just uh, this uh, last month? There was a six-site study um, as part of the uh, EDIN uh, HUP uh, study. Um, John Sims is the first author. He's from EVMS. And uh, that's exactly for, for the reason that you talk about. Uh, the study showed that we are one of the sites to participate, that it is possible to get the identical spectrum. But I want to emphasize it is possible. 
But it's unlikely you will get the same spectrum if you don't do something about that. What we had to do is quite a bit. We have one serviceman from Cyphergen that went to all the six sites and tuned the mas machine to exactly the same. Okay, that's the first thing. We have one set of quality control sample we sent to all the six labs. We said you have to calibrate the machine exactly like this, and you have to pass them with certain intensity and so forth, and you know, and so forth. So we did all those things, and we monitored them. The study took almost a year. So the point is that it is possible to get identical, but it's unlikely unless you standardize many, many of those parameters. Do you have experience with that? Uh, uh, yes, we, we, do. we do. Yeah, yeah. And, and I understand you're the only Saudi in Puerto Rico. Is that correct? Yes. There's only one. Are you getting good support from Cyphergen? Oh, no. <laughs> well, we fight <laughs> because they don't want to come here very often. It's far. I can tell you that this call actually came from Cyphergen. <laughs> <laughs> They're looking for me. I'm going to tell them. <laughs> yeah, I, I need to tell them that, uh, that, uh, that you need better support and so forth. For that. Yeah, it's true. It, it's, um, I, I also told some people this morning that uh, we collaborate with some other institution that has Saudis, and they couldn't get it to work. So they actually decided that the, that's why they sent all the sample to us. And, and we work with them. I think that the uh, Saudi problem is that it's a good technology, but it is not as simple as they told you. There's a lot of variables that go to play in terms of getting consistent results for that. Unless you, you do those things, you're not going to get the useful result. Yes. We're, we're getting consistent results yeah. now with the robotics and uh, uh, doing a lot of, uh, we're also trying to do fractionation. Yeah. Uh, but we've been working with cell lysate, and we're getting a lot of, now we're, but it, it's been a while. I uh -huh. like yes. And we tried to, like, like with Nebraska, to have the same parameters and everything, and it was like a year waste Is that time. Okay. <laughs> and finally, they still didn't get the same, uh, exactly the same profile. Yeah. So we, uh, we decided we were going to work uh, on our own and, and then compare the results later on, but not that we have to have the same exact right, result right. because it yeah. it's very cumbersome. And they didn't tune up the machine like right. they did with your six right. machines. So, so, uh, so but uh, as mentioned about a HUPO study, it turned out that not just Saudi, but you know, high end mass back, each lab, they don't do it the same way and they sometimes come up with different results as well for that. So. Thank you, Dr. Chen. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.